Is everybody in? Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. This is very real. Fantastic. This drug is dangerous. Wrong. You cannot play with it. It's not funny. It's, it's not something to laugh about. Good people don't smoke marijuana. Shut your little punk ass up. But the more you hate me, the more you will learn. learn, learn. Welcome to episode 32 of the Autoflower Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Delaney. We have a very special guest this week, one that I'm very excited about, not to undermine any other guest at all, but uh, our guest this week is unique in my opinion, meaning that there aren't many like him. But before we get started, allow me to do the usual housekeeping by reminding you to follow the podcast on Instagram at Autoflower Podcast, like the Facebook page, and follow on Twitter at Autoflower Pod. You can also follow my personal grow account on Instagram if you're interested at Tourette Grower. And the links are in the show notes for you, as always. Don't forget, on July 31st, I'll be giving away an Herbs Now dryer on Patreon. And in a few weeks, I'll be giving away a package on Instagram with a hat, shirt, a sticker, and a seed pack. So if you're on Instagram, keep an eye out for that as well. Okay, get out a notepad. And a dictionary man because our guest Matthew is an extremely smart guy who is going to drop some serious knowledge bombs on us man it was such an honor to sit and chat with this guy we both agreed to have him back on sooner than later so we can get more in depth into some home grower talk uh, that might be a little more relevant for us but uh, but we do get into chatting about some caterpillars thrips aphids viruses and some other stuff uh, caterpillars thrips and aphids are the pests that i deal with so the conversation naturally flowed in that direction but uh, if you are a member of the patreon family please know and don't forget that there is a bonus episode waiting for you there where matthew answers uh, the personal questions that you guys had asked uh, a couple weeks ago so he was kind enough to go through each question with me. So anyways, without further jibber-jabber, please welcome to the Autoflower Podcast, entomologist, hope I said that right, mycologist, botanist, crop consultant, and IPM specialist, Matthew freaking Gates. Go ahead, I'm sorry. You, you jumped oh. airplanes and stuff? <laughs> yeah, let's start with that one. Uh, <laughs> Before I became an integrated pest management specialist, um, uh, young Matthew Gates was interested in naturalism in general. I'm an Eagle Scout. I went through Boy Scouts. Um, I was interested in insects and, you know, plants and the environment. And there were a lot of fascinations I had that I now know have scientific disciplines attached to them. And a lot of it's sort of interdisciplinary. But when I was in high school, even though I had all these passions, um, I was pretty sure that I wanted to join the U.S. Army as a military intelligence officer. That was actually, I specifically knew what I wanted to do. Of course, it didn't mean that I would. And I went through military training a little bit. Um, I'm always cautious to talk about it because uh, I never commissioned. So I was mm -hmm. on the track to become a commissioned officer, and I didn't, didn't re uh, reach that objective. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want people thinking that I'm stealing anyone's valor by like saying that I had that experience but I did go through a, a program where um, I was able to jump out of airplanes in tandem with the Golden Knights nice. um, which is a pair uh, sort of pair not paratrooper but um, they're they're based in the, with the a second airborne and so I got to I got to jump out of planes with them and they do a lot of cool things at sports shows and that sort of a thing so that was a cool experience. Um, I got to go up to Camp Roberts and work with a combat engineer group. Um, I learned, I got to uh, set off a satchel charge and a few other things and learn a little bit about debt cord and yeah, but um, I mean, those experiences, I've, I've always liked things like strategy and tactics and battlefield stuff and yeah. um, I, I really love that and a lot of that translated to 
the you know the quote unquote the war on pests and pathogens and mm. I feel like that mentality uh, very I like to think that I'm a very analytical person so I think that that kind of um, behooved me for this kind of work both kinds of work would require a lot of analytical ability but on the one hand I didn't feel like I could really make the difference that I wanted to in the military uh, that I could do in agriculture and I think that I chose the right path for me uh, what a cool experience still though do you're like this undercover badass that I didn't even know about <laughs> I try well you were talking earlier before you hit record um, you did feel like I was you used the word humble right I do yeah. try to, I try to be as a pretty humble sometimes I get everyone likes to strut a little bit but sure. yeah I, I don't like to be too yeah. much like that yeah, you got to have a little bit to to live healthy with boundaries, but but yeah, I see what you're saying, man. You you're super humble, dude, and that's why I like you. That, that's why I uh I think that's why a lot of people like you and you're just super smart. And then now you've got like this undercover like Chuck Norris badass dark side to you that I didn't even know. So Yeah, uh, it, it, it's <laughs> it's cool. a, it's a I appreciate that. It's a double-edged sword a little bit cuz you know, some people have opinions about that kind of a thing, and I sure. and I and I think that's totally valid too. And um, yeah. and I think I think you're right. I think that I'm. I think people like my work, partly because of my personality, and I'm glad that people resonate with it. Because, like I was also saying before you hit record, I, um, you know, I've been able to connect with so many like-minded people, mm-hmm. and that's been a real. Uh, real boon mm-hmm. yeah that's that great is. man so when it comes to the the arena of cannabis i mean how how did you get into that do you do you partake in cannabis too or are you just around it and helping people out do you, oh, grow, you grow yourself, yourself? i um i've been in cannabis since my late teens so even when I was going through the the like military process, the, mm-hmm. the going to college and then doing the ROTC, um, I was helping out a friend growing, and I remember very vividly having this experience with him because he he was growing, I think, primarily because it was cool to be a dealer of cannabis. Like oh, that okay. was that was kind of. Like, he didn't say it that way, but all of his actions were that way. And he might not even been cognizant of it himself. And I think, because, like, for example, you know, he like, he always wanted to give discounts to his buddies, which was fine, except mm-hmm. for the fact that we couldn't sustain it. So I was in charge of a lot of the logistical stuff. Um, and this is a very small sort of thing. And... Um, you know, just practically just even with our friends, really, just helping out our friends, you know, growing something good um, that we can share. And I don't know, I just felt like we should either just grow for our friends and be cool about it. Or if we're going to do something more than that, you know, we have to like understand inputs and outputs and that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, that was very, but that was very, very much in the infancy. I, I didn't have, um, a full appreciation or sort of um, foundation for my outlook that I do now. And that really evolved in the next four or five years. But I would say that I've been working with cannabis for the last decade or so. Um, oh, and, I'm, oh. and, I'm, and I'm 28, so since I was about 18. Do you hear my mm-hmm. echo or is that just me? Could just be you. Maybe it's because my mic is on. Oh, maybe. Oh, now I don't hear it. That would be that then. Hopefully oh, it doesn't oh. ruin the audio. No, if you can't hear it, it's probably, I don't know, hopefully it's not recording like that. That's all I'm concerned about. Um, but man, that is so, that's that's cool. That's good to know. Because I wasn't sure, like, if you, um, you know, if you were just kind of, like, outside of cannabis and you kind of came into it. But and then I you knew so much about it and stuff. And not just bugs, like the plant itself. I, I started to kind of assume that you had been around it at least a little bit, you know. Um, but that's really cool. And it's with, with growing, um, becoming so popular these days, especially now with legalization popping up everywhere, it's really cool to just for you to even offer 
it's just cool to have a guy like you around. I mean, even, you know, so people can, um, people can learn off of your passion, you know, uh, because growing cannabis, especially outdoors, there's, there's some significant pest issues, uh, to deal with as you're probably well aware of, right? Oh, definitely. And I've worked with other crops too, not just cannabis. And I think that also, I feel like I'm both an insider and an outsider just to respond to that, um, sort of perspective. Cause I think you're, you're right. Kind of like there's some insider quality cause I've been with it for a lot a large part of my life, but, um, a large part of my life as a 28 year old is different than like somebody else older. And, um, I've definitely taken perspectives from, I think sort of outside the can the mainstay Canada culture, uh, but I, I'm a born and raised San Diegan and I live in San Diego currently. And there's a interesting San Diego, California culture with cannabis in particular. Mm-hmm. Right, what, do you, what do you mean by that? I'm, I'm about probably 50 minutes north of you. Up, 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 up here in the Temecula area. area. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Did you yeah. know so, about so. that yet? Or did you just find that out? No, I, I, I knew, I kind of knew, I kind of put together that you lived in San Diego based off of your posts and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I kind of figured. So I knew you weren't far from me, but um, so you you mean like in like the San? Because I mean, even though I'm close to San Diego, I haven't really spent a whole lot of time there other than the beaches, to be honest with you. So what do you mean, what do you like, mean about like about the about cannabis, cannabis culture there? Yeah, so I I guess I most generally mean just like kind of California as a okay. whole. Um, I, I maybe I worded that inarticulately, but. Um, even in San Diego specifically though, um, there's a group of people that I work with, that I've worked with in the past. Some of them have moved. Um, uh, some of them go by the moniker of the San Diego's finest. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, but I'm not, uh, I'm not one that would know how to even quantify that. But, um, uh, there are some people who have bred some interesting cultivars of cannabis, like a uh, hog's breath with a W H A W G S hog's breath. Um, there's also, uh, <clears throat> some, uh, bull rider bull riders, I think known for coming from San Diego as well. At least that's what I've been told. You know, I don't, that's the other mm-hmm. thing is that I, I recognize that there's a lot of, um, oral history and necessarily it's kind of hard to verify some of this stuff and maybe that makes me sound like somebody who's you know (laughs) i don't know what but you know i i think that it's sort of it's interesting to see all the microcosms and i probably don't even have a complete picture myself Mm -hmm. um you know something you know some things might have been born and and died before publicity even occurred um you know so it's hard to record. That's that's never been recorded, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what would you say here in Southern California, since um, there's a lot of people who grow here? Um, what, what, is there? Do you think there's like one particular um, higher threat to outdoor cannabis than anything else, whether it be a pest or some type of mold spore? I don't know how all that even works, but what, what do you think about that? I would. I would say that in in Southern California in particular, um, you deal with a lot of the problems that general agriculturalists do. So not just in cannabis, but like ligus bug is a big one, the tarnished plant bug, genus ligus. Um, there's a lot of those that, that sweep around the strawberry fields. Um, I've seen them feed on tons of different plants um they're not they're not like specific to southern california only but they are very common in southern california and several species that are really bad are almost always exclusively found in california um so i would say those are kind of a localized hazard um but they're not going to necessarily kill your plants um but the ones that you'll find that are that are a huge issue are kind of general problems your spider mites your silver leaf white fly Um, maybe you're, maybe I've seen some people have, um, uh, some complaints at least over 
the glassy wing sharpshooter, which is a pest in grapes, and it confers a lot of diseases. Mm. Or well, it confers one particular bacteria that confers a whole bunch of a whole bunch of diseases for various plants. And I don't think there's any research on it for cannabis, whether it affects cannabis poorly or not. Um, there's some Southern Californian viruses, uh, one of which is a leptospirosis virus. And the creamy viruses in general might be a problem for cannabis because if leptospirosis virus could infect cannabis, some of the other related viruses um, could as well. Th- the creamy viruses are thought to originate in Southern California or the California area, but the LCV that was found in cannabis was actually found in the authorized farms in Israel, which is a long ways away from here. And it was vectored by the silverleaf whitefly which is a super vector for like over 180 plant viruses, um, which is very common globally and thought to originate in India, actually. So, uh, you know, it was sort of a perfect storm. The white fly comes over here, grabs the virus, virus is compatible, uh, spreads it and many other viruses to all kinds of other plants. So, so uh, humans aren't the only species that have to deal with global viruses. Yes, and to be quite honest, even for like, uh, although this isn't a virus, but like um, the malarial pathogen, the plasmodium in mosquitoes isn't great for the mosquito either. We'd actually be doing them a favor if we got rid of those. (laughs) Oh, I see. That's interesting, man. You know, it's so interesting to hear you talk about viruses and stuff when it comes to plants, because that's just kind of a new concept to me. I I know that it exists. I've just never really looked into it. And it's just... uh, it's just so interesting. Like, what would one of these viruses, what does it do to a plant? Does it invade the DNA, like kind of like a virus does with a human cell and stuff? Yeah, um, it's, it's very uh, similar. Um, and I'm not a virologist, but as you can tell, I'm very passionate about IPM, such an interdisciplinary specialty. That's why I like to use that phrase that that you know or that that real job title but like yeah yeah it's such a it covers so many things um or at least it can it doesn't have to um and i would i so virus so plant viruses do inf- infect the host cell um and they so basically whether they're rna viruses or dna viruses um they have to they invade the cell they want to use the cell's machinery to make more of themselves, essentially. This is pretty much the case, unless they are a retrovirus or something that integrates its whole genome into the host, which also happens and has happened to human and other uh, animal ancestors. Wow. wow. So, so do, do some of these viruses in, like, let's say, like you were mentioning earlier, I think the strawberry fields or something like that, do... Do these viruses, can they take down like entire crops, like commercial, you know, farming and stuff? Absolutely. Um, So the other thing with viruses is that what makes them sort of difficult, what makes them really difficult and hard to control is that unlike a bacteria or a fungus or a water mold or something like that, um, viruses kind of live intracellularly to the cell. And so... They have to move, they do move systemically through the plant, um, but not in, not nearly in the same way. And they kind of protect themselves through the, the way that they move. And they just basically take over a cell, make it reproduce a ton, ton of itself. And then that cell lyses usually um, and blows up. And then those cells and those particles, those infectious particles, they move throughout the plant. Um, uh, creamy viruses like the leptospirosis virus cause millions of dollars of damage and they're they're not possible to control because you know for one thing the plants that you're trying to save um, they don't have like they're usually they're annuals anyways so mm-hmm. the amount of time it would take for you to like unvirus all of those plants wouldn't really make sense economically so that's the main problem we don't really have a technology that allows us to do this and also just the unique way that viruses infect cells instead of like kind of living in or on the plant makes them a lot more arduous and antiviral agents can't really penetrate you know it's kind of selectively it's sort of we just don't really have a good way to do that there there are um 
when we try to defend against viruses, the main thing that we try to defend against is either the vector for the mm-hmm. virus or so like usually plant viruses um, require some sort of a, a vector, usually an insect, but sometimes also a mite or other arthropod. Um, and yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it totally, totally does. does. I just, I just... It's just interesting because I'm just comparing it kind of what's going on in the world right now. Let's, you know what, dude? You, you know what you need to do? You can get rich, dude. You need to come up with a vaccine. You just inject that shit right into that plant, buddy. You're good to go. What do you think about that? I think that the idea is <laughs> is possible, man. Um, I, is it really? I, is it really? I well, there are there are there are plant vaccines actually. Um, uh-huh. There are there are technologies kind of for that, but they're sort of in their infancy. And, and, um, I will, I will vehemently admit that I don't really know all there is to know about those particular technologies. I think they're sort of bleeding edge. So the, the main problem, I've actually seen viruses used against pests even, mm-hmm. um, specifically the one that comes to my mind is, I think it's a bacula virus or something, but it's a it's a virus that infects um, Lepidoptera, so moths and butterflies, mm-hmm. and uh, I think they it's specific to oh what was it? I think it's made by Andermatt, and they're I think from the Netherlands or they're Swedish I think, and I think it goes after one particular species of caterpillar, and so the cater so you spray it I think. And then the caterpillar eats the virus particle and it gets into their body and it destroys them from the inside out. Just like other like bacterial or fungal biopesticides do. Mm-hmm. Um, but, vi- but viruses, it's hard to keep them viable outside their host for long enough. And when you start talking about technologies to make viruses viable outside their host when they're normally not, mm, you know, <laughs> some people might be a little bit uh, <laughs> reticent, especially nowadays. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. Even that's so all, fascinating. Even before all of this, I was I I've always been sort of pushing that boundary. I've always I'm pretty accepting of that idea because we I mean it's kind of like we either resign ourselves to the idea that we'll just always have these mil like because also ecologically we can't just like kill all the vectors like that's not the solution. Mm-hmm. You know that will have that will have huge ecological problems um, associated with it. So we have to just find a targeted way. I feel like, and I think mm-hmm. that there's an answer there. But you know, there's tons, there's tons and tons of viruses that we're learning about every day. And if you gave me the time, I could even go into why some of the evolution about viruses. I've t- I've talked about it on my uh, YouTube channel and stuff too. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I love that stuff so much. Just mm-hmm. like. This, just as you are fascinated, so am I. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to. I kind of want to shift gears if, if you're okay with it, because you said something that kind of triggered um, a thought into my head. Um, as far as like a home grower, do you mind if I ask you some questions? I totally have no problem with it. I won't even bill you. <laughs> nice. Thank you, man. Uh, <laughs> what do you think you about, think? like, for an average home grower like myself, because I grow indoors and outdoors, and when I say that, I mean I grow in my in my shop, in my garage, and I also grow in my backyard. And that's what I mean by that, in a tract home. I'm, I don't have a farm. What is your opinion on battling pests and stuff when it comes to an outdoor grow? Do you see, well, I mean the approach, um, an integrated pest management. Like, what would that look like? Did, are you referring to other pests, mites, um, like parasitic insects and like the parasitic wasp, you know, like and stuff like that? Or are you referring to like um, organic sprays or I assume you're not referring to like pesticides and and harmful stuff like that? Well, so uh, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, covers all of those things you mentioned, even the pesticides. But you know, it's really just because it's a system. It just it describes a sort of perspective about taking out um, problems, I would say. Um, so, you know, ir- regardless of the crop, regardless of the context, it's a system to sort of create your context, essentially. Um, and it's, it, it's a holistic perspective. And so personally, I don't, like in cannabis, for example, 
I'm a huge advocate for biocontrol agents, biopesticides, um, and for health and safety reasons, I'm a huge advocate against in you know various systemic insecticides. And I, I come from a background where I've been, unfortunately, I've even been exposed a few times. I have some horror stories where I actually worked with somebody who intentionally exposed me to some um, unbeknownst to me, which was very, very, it made me livid, let's put it that way. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Made your so, Rambo like, like, uh, 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 <laughs> I uh, was not a fan, but you know, I'm very empathetic to the fact that like sometimes there aren't good exa- there sometimes there aren't good solutions, um, either because there's like a new pest or because people live in a place where the law doesn't allow you to use certain compounds or biocontrol agents. Um, every context is different. So for me, IPM means a holistic perspective where you consider as many contextual cues as possible to arrive at a sort of comprehensive strategy. Um, I suppose you can see some of the military stuff I was talking about earlier coming into play there. Mm -hmm. Um, We used to say uh, looking through things through a METTC lens, which uh, I don't remember the whole... um, uh, acronym, but basically it's like all the different variables that you have to consider for a context, and it's sort of the same kind of concept. Um, although this is not where IPM came from, this is just my own sort of perspective here. Um, yeah, people, yeah. people have to. It, it's great to integrate as many little things as possible, from um, you know clearing away unnecessary vegetation potentially that could host pests that you don't want to. Um, purchasing and growing plants of a particular cultivar that might do the best in your area, maybe even resist certain pests or pathogens, that's part of IPM. Uh, How you, your cultural controls, like how you harvest, how you go into the plants, how you um, water, how you, you know, how you do everything around your plants also is a major factor as well. So all of those things. Yeah, you know, I, you know what I? Sorry, I, I think I of think like of, uh, uh, every time every I go time into I go like Home there. Depot or I go into Lowe's or a nursery. There's a local nursery here that I like to go to, but I d- almost don't like to go to them because I think it's just my o- OCD and stuff, or I don't know. Like, but I'll come home and all I can think of is like, what if I've got mites all over my clothes and I don't even know it? Yeah, I know what you mean, right? And like, uh, there's this term called a, a fomite. A fomite is like a, a, an object that can be a sort of carrier for some sort of pest, right? So um, like, a, a, you know, like your clothes can be fomites or the, um, pack, the seed packages you might buy can be fomites if like people weren't careful with them or the hulls of seeds, I suppose, can also be fomites too, in a manner of speaking. Um, you know, I totally jive with what you're saying, like, Sometimes going to the places themselves can introduce a risk, I think. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm, I was battling? I just harvested um, a few days ago, but I was battling, and my outdoor grow was... Well, I battle a few things. Usually white flies, but honestly, like, I can manage those. Um, like, fungus gnats, I can usually manage by, you know, keeping the soil a little drier or bottom feeding it and stuff or putting some, you know, a layer of of uh some type of mulch or something on top but when it comes to like thrips um and aphids man and caterpillars those are my three things when i grow here outdoors is thrips aphids and caterpillars the caterpillars i've kind of taken care of by building a little screen house it's like a greenhouse but i just made it out of garden screen so the moths aren't really getting in there but the thrips um man those things like it's a good thing i harvested because if my plants were going to go like another month i don't know like what would have been because they were starting to have an effect on the leaves and stuff you know what do you what do you think about thrift and i bought like some i don't even remember what i bought some uh oh they were green lacewing eggs or something like that i bought them off amazon but if i'm honest with you i don't i don't know if they did anything and i know i probably waited too long and all that but what are, you, what are your suggestions on battling like thrips, aphids, stuff like that? Okay, so like from an IPM perspective, I just want to say good on you using the mesh screen because that's a physical blocker, you know, and like a lot of moths 
pretty much all mods, even the micro mods, don't really have an ability to go through the mesh screening. So, like, that's, like, one example where you can, like, take them out of the equation, partly at least, depending mm -hmm. on how fastidious you are and if you're able to get every spot and everyone's location is a little bit different and their resources and time and everything. Um, hey, everyone. Sorry to interrupt. I want to let you know about the sponsor of today's episode, My Herbs Now, the creator of the Herbs Now Dryer. Safe, consistent drying is key. And if you want to save time, space, ramp up production, or even sample a part of your plant, then the Herbs Now Cannabis Dryer is for you. It's a great alternative to traditional drying. Visit MyHerbsNow.com today to browse the packages on their online store. Now let's get back to Chad and Matthew. So for caterpillars, especially down here, there's a few different ones that we get that can be kind of a, a bother. Um, depending on the species, like it can be much more of a bother or a little bit less of a problem. Um, sometimes we get the army worms. So in the Spadoptera genus, um, those can be kind of a nuisance. Uh, they're a big vegetable pests as well, the various Spadoptera. Um, there's the tobacco budworm moth that I've seen in this area as well. Um, and it's a big problem because it'll bore right into the flower material. And then that uh, what I'm dealing with. that's what you're dealing with. Yeah, damn. Yeah, those are a real big problem. I do often suggest that people use mesh screening for them. Um, but of course, not everyone can use it at the same level or use some sort of netting at least. Mm -hmm. Just to keep, if you can keep the, if you can keep the moths from laying eggs and you've disrupted the cycle. IPM, at least for me, a big part of IPM is disrupting uh, as many sort of like stages of the life cycle as possible using various means, uh, natural chemistries, natural biocontrol agents, um, you know, artificial screening, you know, some sort of barrier, maybe mm -hmm. multiple barriers, you know. Um, it, it just really depends on the context. So that's like with the moths and caterpillars sort of briefly. Uh, I like that you use that physical control. Um, but like some of them, they will sort of create, as larvae, they'll create shelters with silk and the leaves. And they'll kind of, some of them are leaf tires or leaf rollers. And when they do that, um, it's hard to apply like a biopesticide or something that's like, a contact, you know, they have to feed on the material at least, or it has to at least make contact with their bodies. But if it does not, if it does not have those things, then, you know, they don't like move from their shelter until they pupate because that's what they've de developed to do usually. So, um, it can be very arduous to deal with moths and, um, I have no great joy in saying that, you know what I mean? I really wish yeah, it was. Yeah. I really wish there was an easier answer for that. It does really depend on the species, though, mm. in my opinion. For yeah, a three, I mean, oh yeah. I think uh, making that barrier was a huge difference this year, this this round, um, because I I didn't have any caterpillar problems actually, because those are the ones that I usually get. They're like, I'll I'll look at a, a certain part of the flower and it'll look a little. I'll be like, oh, is there bud rot in there or something? And I'll break it open. And there's just like those little caterpillars inside, deep inside the cola, just eating it from the inside out. Yeah, that's like, it's just the worst because it's worse than finding an, a worm in your apple, <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. um, as I, I've had that experience a few times where like I'll see a sort of... Um, uh, you know the nugs and i'll i'll uh i'll notice that like it almost looks like not necessarily like rot but like something's been dislodged or mm -hmm. kind of like moved or, it almost looks like something was pushed out um you know and it's the fat larvae that's dining on the leaf material and then you'll see like the frass and then that frost that frass will get sort of uh micro sized and then then maybe like you know, the whole bud becomes uh, mycelial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've yeah, had I've to, had to um, um, chop, chop entire colas off because of that. Yeah, me too. It's really egregious. It's it's just such a heartbreak. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on thrips? Um, 
I caught them too late because I had never dealt with them before, I don't think. Um, and I'm assuming they were thrips. I got a jeweler's loop out and I looked and I looked online and uh, it sure looked like them. And so, um, and they were on the leaves and, uh, you know, and then I can tell that they were, and then from what I read, they drop back into your, or they lay eggs on your leaves and then don't they hatch and then they drop into your soil for a little bit of their life and then they come back up and go back up on your leaves and they just start this vicious cycle. Is that how it works? And what's the best way to battle those? Yeah, good question. So there's about 6,000 different species of thrips, but only a very small fraction, like less than 1% are really big pests. Um, and you probably, if I had to guess, without any context, you're probably dealing with the western flower thrips and possibly a couple of other different uh, species that are the pest species that are very common um, in crops generally. And for me, and actually right now I'm working with somebody who's dealing with a big thrips problem as well. It's the season. Um, since you're in the area too, you know, I'm sure you're aware that a lot of the weedy plants will sort of die off. Um, the rains actually kept them alive for a little bit longer here in this area um, in Southern California. And so I think they, that sort of like swarming behavior, looking for um, food, during the senes the senescence sort of was um, pushed off like a month or so or a few weeks depending on where you where you live um, the thrips are a little bit easier to deal with in my opinion if you know that they're coming and you're able to use biocontrol agents like Amblyseia swirskii and Neoshilus cucumeris and uh, even some Californicus as well though those are mostly for spider mites um, having sort of the ability to apply them in like um, sachets, which are pretty common, uh, can be helpful. But the big thing with biocontrols is you have to use the right amount. Um, and it's hard to really know if you're going to get under or over a certain amount if you don't have data from before. And even then, you m your data might not be comprehensive, right? You don't necessarily know season to season that things mm -hmm. are gonna be exactly the same. Um, but like I said, for the, for other insects, clearing away um, the plant material that's unnecessary can be helpful, but you have to do it at the right time, otherwise you'll stimulate that same sort of like exodus that happens from the fields um, or wherever you're growing to like you. I have some friends up in the high deserts of Inyo County um, that... Uh, don't have to deal with pest problems very much because they're in the high deserts and there's not a whole lot of things going up, going around in their mm -hmm. general vicinity. So good for them. Um, uh, so there's a lot of different biocontrol agents for them. So the, you're right. The, the adults are the, they'll lay eggs in, in leaf tissue sometimes even, um, or just on top of it. And then they have little larvae, and then those larvae will feed on the plant, and then they'll pupate. Uh, and when they do that, they sometimes fall into the soil, and that kind of keeps them away from getting hit by foliar predators like the mites I just mentioned, the swirskii and the Um And then they'll pupate in the soil, and then come out as an adult, and they'll be able to fly around wherever they want. And they can move a great distance as well. Um, there are sometimes I like to use Botanigard for that and just like apply it as a drench or a sprench, just again to like disrupt them. So, to give the disruption model sort of a good example, I might preventively try to apply predatory mites um, so that they'll affect all stages of life except for the adult, I believe. I believe the adult's a little bit too big for them usually. Um, and then I would also want to apply something to the soil or the substrate or whatever you're using. Um, in order to disrupt the pupation, because if a lot of the larvae maybe survive to, pu to pupate, but most of them die, then you're really cutting down the adult stage, which is great, because then you won't have as many eggs. And so the biocontrols will go after, and the botanic guards, Bouveria bastiana, which is an entomopathogenic fungus, so they're all biocontrols, but the mites will feed on the egg and the various stages of larvae, and also even the pupae, and then the uh, fungus can be applied against the pupae. So if you get like 25% kill at least with the biocontrols and you get another 25% with the pupae, 
you're really going to, you know, reduce the numbers of adults that are coming in and they are going to, they'll, they'll either be ingressing from the field or they'll be developing in your crop. And so you'll have both of those populations to contend with, um, depending on the season. Man. So if I'm only like, so I had four plants outside, you know, and they're auto flowers. Um, so they they finish, you know, the ones I were growing finish in about 65 days from sprout. So they don't get too huge. Um, but I mean, it's almost like, where do I even get all of this stuff that you're talking about? Like these, these species of, of predatory mites that you're talking about. Um, I mean, is it even worth my buck if I'm just growing a few plants? What are your thoughts on that? Like for a small home grower like me? I appreciate that. Uh, you know that I'm uh, a common panel member on the Cheap Home Grow podcast? Yeah. 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 That's where you found me, right? No. No. Oh, it was not. Okay. Um, well, I encourage people to take a look at that podcast because although we do get into the weeds a little bit, we do sometimes talk in this perspective. So I really like this question mm -hmm. because I think it's a really good one. And a lot of people uh, earnestly ask this question, like, is it really worth it if I'm growing six plants, four plants, one plant? And I would say that um, it depends on who you buy from um, and what your objective is. So I would say that for a lot of people, um, it might be worth it purely on the fact that like their own time and effort is worth it. And if they put a lot of time and effort into it, then they'd really like to see the the result. But I, you know, a lot of times these these groups work with commercial growers and they don't really even cater to home growers of various plants, but you can buy these mites and other biocontrol agents from distributors that are sort of uh, secondary or even tertiary. Um, I generally don't recommend that for commercial growers, and I, I want them to get their stuff from the primary, like insectaries and things like this. Um, but the problem is that they are, t they are usually much more expensive, they usually deal in a, a larger bulk, and it's usually pricier. Or I think I already said that, but um, so but there are tertiary groups that have a little bit lower quality in my opinion because they're not coming directly from the source and they're very perishable. Um, or at least some of them are quite perishable in this way, um, so it can be hard to mitigate that uh, effect of kind of getting them secondhand or thirdhand. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it's worth it for the right price. Because usually, if you're even able to get like 50% of the amount that you would get somewhere else, again, from a non-commercial perspective, that's still probably way more than you need. And I have a video on my YouTube channel that goes over banker plants using uh, pepper plants in particular, fl uh, ornamental ones because they keep their flowers open longer. Mm -hmm. uh, the two predatory mites I mentioned, they feed on pollen. And so if you have an ornamental plant that produces a lot of pollen, then the mites will the mites will eat that because they're omnivorous and they'll be very fecund on the on the pollen that they they can even triple their population on a pure pollen diet and so you can kind of keep them around for longer and possibly even for a very long time almost indefinitely um, with the right setup and so I often encourage people to be able to kind of do that themselves then they'll become the insectary and they may even they may only need like inoculations over time, like uh, maybe because all of the flowers turn into fruit eventually, um, or you know maybe they're seeing a small population bump, or they know that it's the season where that's going to happen, so they might like buy a little bit extra, or maybe put in a couple more pepper plants or something like this, interspersed with their cannabis plants. I've had several people come to me and tell me that it worked really well for them at least. Oh, that's oh, cool. That's... Yeah, because I was going to, um, I reached out to a place locally here in Southern California and they got back to me and they were like really nice and they like gave me the rundown of different species I should get, just that they named the same ones you just did um, and told me what they did, you know, the, get these for the, uh, for the adults, get these for the eggs, get these for the, you know, pupae and, and I was like, okay, okay. And then when I, and then I, they gave me a link to buy the stuff, but I, when I went to buy it, I can tell it was probably more for larger grows because it would have been like $330 or something with shipping. 
for me to get all of these. And I was just like, I'm not going to spend three hundred and thirty dollars on four on four auto flower plants. That was <laughs> that my, was my, you know, my idea. So what I did is I just I went on Amazon and I ended up ordering those green those green lacewing eggs. But I don't even know if those did anything, you know, or, or like you're saying, they could have been dead by the time I got them. Yeah, they could have been dead or weakened or a lot of them cannibalized each other. So you're not getting the amount that you're told that you're going to get. Um, in addition to that, um, the tertiary sources, I think, can be a little bit lower quality uh, more often because um, just the nature of, of that process. Uh, but I agree with you. It's just not worth it if it's going to be so costly. I, I totally empathize with that. And I think that's for a long time, biocontrols um, were looked at very skepti skeptically, rightly, because sometimes people would have a lot of trouble using them because they they would be told on a commercial scale, on a, a commercial scale, they would be told, hey, you should use this many. And then they're like, wow, that's really expensive. We're going to do half that. And then they're like, okay, well, we said that you should use this many. And then it doesn't work. And then they tell the biocontrol people that they're snake oil salesmen. And then that's mm -hmm. been a big problem for for a, for the beginning part of biocontrol's history, really, kind of turn of the century, 1900s sort of a thing. I think I have that right. People have been using biocontrols for a long time in various ways, but kind of that commercial arthropod-based stuff um but i think the the sort of um market share of biocontrols and the sort of evolution of those technologies that allow us to make them and the popularity has become such that we can sort of use them on a smaller scale because it makes economic sense in some cases you also got to know what you're going after too like lace wings for aphids versus predatory mites that might, like I said, Californicus, you know, is generally used against spider mites, whereas Swirskii and Cucumerus is used as a, sort of an omnivore. It eats pollen, like I mentioned, and it eats, um, it's sometimes, they, they've been known to feed on moth eggs to a small degree, but I wouldn't, again, use them. That doesn't make them a biocontrol agent. That just means that they are polyphagous. They eat a lot of different things. The uh, silverleaf whitefly larvae, they eat um, thrips, they eat, um, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll chew on a spider mite or two as well. Um, and I, I know that I'm missing one. Oh yeah, of course. Um, they'll feed on small mites like russet mites and broad mites too. Mm -hmm. um, so those are several of those, the, the whiteflies, the thrips, and the russet mites and the broad mites also go after cannabis. So... And to me, they're definitely worth it to stave off four and maybe incidentally five or six groups of sort of pests. To me, that's a big cost saving. But, you know, there are ways to kind of extend their life in your crop that I think a lot of people aren't doing. And, you know, it also has bothered me because I think commercial agents, they don't want you to do that, right? Because then you're buying less mites. But in the same way, you're also not their primary um target so you know maybe it works out <laughs> yeah yeah so what what would you do then if you're if you're a guy like me um and you're just growing a few plants at home and you've got this thrips infestation um that's doing obvious damage to your plant i mean what would you do if you don't want to spend you know a hundred or three hundred dollars um what what would you suggest for for like thrips and aphids because i have problems with aphids too so um, some of the things that you can do to help yourself out, in my opinion, is if the natural environment near you is conducive to this, um, you can all you can attract beneficial insects to your location for a little bit of control. And I wouldn't rely on this primarily. I think a lot of people talk about this as if, um, and some people this is true. They kind of live in a fantastical sort of world where um, they're surrounded by plants and tons of different kinds of plants and they might be growing in the thick of it and so it might be much more easier or much more likely that they'll attract the kinds of parasitoids and predators that they want um, so for me I think intercropping even in a small way like some other plants that can attract like sweet alyssum 
at least some uh, those like small floret, the small flowers, uh, they're white or various other shades of colors. Um, they're very great for a lot of parasitic wasps in my experience. They um, are very attractive to hoverflies as well. Um, they can also get pests themselves. So like not for nothing, they can also sometimes get uh, thrips and aphids too. But then mm-hmm. the, par- the parasites and predators also come either for the nectar or for the pollen or for the prey. And so um, if you do that, you can have a little bit of that colonization that happens, or you can at least keep a population that you might buy commercially. So my second option or my second piece of advice is to buy, you know, a very maybe like the lowest amount of Cucumis or Swirskii or some other predator. So for thrips, those two. For aphids, lace wings are a good option. Um, there are various lace wing products out there. You can get adults. But green lacewing adults um, don't actually feed on aphids. The brown lacewing adults do, but the green lacewing lacewing adults do not. The larvae do. And so you can get the larvae or you can get the eggs, um, which can be useful, and then apply them. Um, if they're, you've got predator mites, you can buy those capsicum annum. Uh, explosive ember is the cultivar that I use and that I sh- show in my video about uh, using pepper banker plants in this way because that was what an experiment in um, I think UC Riverside mm-hmm. but um, there was an experiment where they checked where they were trying to see if thrips could be prevented through um, uh, maybe even whitefly too I have another report that's like that but basically the the main the main target was actually thrips and um, they found that uh, pepper plants bell pepper plants that had these uh, ornamental pepper plants with them, with the pollen, did a lot better. And um, so I, I think that's a very important thing. So if it were me, I would try to source some predatory mites for the thrips. I would try to source some botanigard or very bastiana product. If I couldn't get that, um, then I wouldn't use the, the Bouveri bastiana product because obviously I cannot. Uh, but sort of um, increasing the productivity of these mites is what I try to do. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are other things that people can do. Like some people are partial to like uh, making their own biopesticides. Do you do anything like that yourself? What do you consider a biopesticide? You mean like a mm-hmm. spray? Yeah, like to define my term, like everything's a pesticide that is used to affect to like kill pests so um and actually i think i think california's um uh at least in california i think technically everything that is like that is a pesticide uh except for water supposedly which kind of makes sense but (laughs) from a definitional standpoint um it's very broad spectrum and um so like some people like to boil um and extract like chemical compounds from various plants like chrysanthemum, um, like that's where pyrethrin originally came from, um, or like neem, using neem in that way. Um, I would caution about using neem either if you have a organic sort of uh, soil microbiome focused grow, because as direct and, and related compounds in neem trees can have some antimicrobial effects to some degree. And to be honest, it's not a very well-researched um, subject, so I can't even talk about it comprehensively. But there are some evidence that azadiractin can have that sort of antimicrobial effect, so you might sort of engender that problem if you use it. But um, the the insecticide, uh, the insecticidal effect of azadiractin and those related compounds is pretty great and pretty broad spectrum. It would also work for thrips. It would also work for aphids pyrethrins, natural pyrethrins from chrysanthemum and other plants, but mostly chrysanthemum um, is effective against those two as well. But um, I don't know if I'd be confident enough in the, in being able to do that appropriately personally, uh, okay. but other people seem to be able to do it pretty well. Yeah, I do. I have some sprays like I have, well, I have neem, but 
I, it's like two years. It's from two years ago. I couldn't stand the smell of that stuff, to be honest with you, dude. And uh, it was just slimy and left my fingers grease. I just didn't like it. And then I read some stuff about how a lot of people say not to use it. And I didn't really couldn't come to a conclusion. So I just kind of walked away from it. And then I'll use like um, there's some products that I got like at, at um, the auto flower cup last year, like this uh, company called Lost Coast plant therapy and so they give you this little bottle of concentrate and you mix it and it's supposedly all organic it's like essential oils but um but i did notice that there was a little bit of uh alcohol in it so i don't i don't know how much i don't remember but i didn't wasn't sure if that was a good idea um other than that the only thing that i've done is like you know mix in some dish soap and spray stuff like that that's that's pretty much it i I think i need to uh i've learned my lesson the last couple of of summers and springs uh that i need i need to to be proactive about um battling this before it happens yeah definitely and i would also caution against using um neem products that you don't know the source of or that you're not sure of the source of because even for good sources uh if they originally come from like other places sometimes um those the 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 product that you're sourcing might have been exposed to pesticides from the uh from the cultivation of the plant that resulted in the neem mm-hmm. cake or whatever product or even a more processed product even you know it doesn't have to be a a, a sort of less processed only product um and also applying it in flour i'm not a huge fan of that myself right, I, right. I yeah so just for just to like kind of put that out there. And also, and like I think I said in the beginning, everyone's situation is different. Lawmakers are a big are a, are a big factor. Um, what's what you're allowed to, what you're not allowed to, what you can even have availability for um, is always changing. So it's kind of hard to speak a little bit generally in that way. Um, and living in California like we do, um, you know, whole entire pesticide companies have like departments specifically for California because uh, it's such a stringent state to um, label pesticides in. Yeah. So in general, uh, with, with we're talking about outdoor grows, right? And then so some of the common stuff, we're just chatting about what I've got problems with. As far as an integrated pest management for indoor do you suggest all the same type of stuff or would your strategy change a bit because there's kind of a buffer between the outdoors and your grow? That's a great question. I would say that a lot of this, a lot of the things change, or I mean, a lot of things actually don't change, but um, that's because the indoor circumstance makes it more, I mean, you, you kind of some things are already taken care of. Right, because of the nature of an indoor grow um, versus an outdoor grow, and a lot of the other dynamics, you have you have control over certain aspects of your cultivation space, like temperature and humidity, ostensibly. But you know, it depends on how indoor you really are, um, and how uh, sort of sophisticated your setup is. Um, but I would say that a lot of the biocontrol suggestions do kind of stay the same and the sort of physical controls the cultural controls change too so like kind of your operating uh strategy can change a little bit because you can make use of quarantine in a different way sometimes um you can also make use of like uh you know just physical barriers um, and that sort of a thing, depending on your setup. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause when I grow, I grow, um, I've always grown here in my, in my garage and, um, you know, the doors opened a lot and, uh, but I've never really had too much of a problem in here. If I'm totally honest with you, I keep it pretty clean. I'm just kind of like that anyways. I like to sweep, you know? often and and you know wipe my tables down and because i got like a screen printing shop out here too so i like to keep it there and you know tidy and clean and uh you know i i've got like some like uh little pest control stuff like uh 
like uh, roach hotels and stuff or stuff like that. I hope you don't hate me for that for getting a roach stuck in a thing. But um, no, I, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Indoors, I just never really had much of a problem except with fungus gnats, but those came from the soil that I had bought at the store. Um, which again, for me, fungus gnats, re- I mean, really aren't too big of a deal for me because I can kind of get ways to battle them down and, and not have to worry about it. Um, but all I usually do is just stick a, like a yellow sticky trap, um, near my plants. I w- I was wondering what your thoughts on those are too. There are various kinds of glue traps. Do you mean, how big are they? Well, I ordered them and they came in a sheet that was probably like five inches by eight inches, but I cut them up with scissors. Okay. So I think these ones are made for, I think those are actually made to be some, somewhat sort of like a, a insect control. Whereas some of them that are smaller are, they're really meant to be like a sampling um, system. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of people, I think, miss, they, they misconstrue the sample glue traps for the like control glue traps. There's even like rolls of sticky glue traps that you can buy industrially um, that people like hang all around their plants and like in the rooms to like catch a bunch of different organisms and they're meant to like stay up there. The sampling uh, cards can be used as like sort of a less than effective um, sort of kill trap but they're actually meant to sort of sample so you can see like hey you know if you if you like if you like change them every week or every two weeks or something then you can see like oh this week i got a white fly for the first time or now i have 25 white fly when for the last four weeks i've only had one or two so you can kind of you can rate trends that way that's what they're primarily used for like I said earlier, I want to be sensitive to your time. So before we sign off, <clears throat> why don't you go ahead and uh, give out any information that you want as far as how people can reach you and contact you or follow you on social media and the internet? Yeah, so you can find my content in a few different places. If you're interested in my integrated pest management research and information, which a lot, which all of it's free, it's very important to me to make it free for people um, to add that value to people who don't have the information available. You can find it on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol, Z E N T H A N O L. And you can also find a lot of my posts on Instagram at Sync Angel, S Y C N or S Y N C H A N G E L. And um, those are the two major places where I post that sort of informational content. Awesome, man. And I will link to all of that in the show notes as well as uh, on the social media posts when I post the episode. So that way everyone can just click on it and and link to you as well. And uh, man, I just really, really, really appreciate your time, bro. Um, Just to chat with you, pick your brain. And uh, I'm going to have to go get a dictionary when I listen back to this. You've got quite the vocabulary. It's impressive, but I think it's really cool. And uh, I just want to say thank you for coming on. And I really look forward to having you back again. Thanks. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to coming back again, answering a bunch more questions. Thank you for giving us your ears for a bit. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Be sure to subscribe to Matthew's YouTube channel, Zinthanol, and follow him on Instagram at Sync Angel. Links are in the show notes for you. I'll also put them uh, in the little preview snippets and stuff on social media. So have a good rest of your week, you guys. See ya. The dried leaves and berries are ground up and made into cigarettes by a simple hand machine. The deadly narcotic is thus quickly and easily prepared for its market.